Hey, welcome to worship. Pastor Troy here with you today. It is so awesome to be in worship with you, and we are in a sermon series called The Church Has Left the Building. So we thought, well, why not? Let's leave the building. Let's go out into the community of Washington, Missouri, and do the message from there today. How about that? So we're pre-taping this. Everything is being done on Wednesday morning of all times, and it is raining. And so today, when you're watching this, I, I understand looking at the weather forecast that Sunday is going to be beautiful. So today, you may be looking right out your door going, where is he? Why is it so, why is it so wet where he is? Well, it was earlier this week. But here's what I'm going to tell you, that the words that are going to be coming from my mouth, the words of Scripture today, the words that are going to be given to us from God are still eternal whether it be Wednesday, Thursday, Sunday, it doesn't matter. Whether it be rainy, whether it be sunny, it doesn't matter. This is the great day to worship God because you have breath in you today, and I am so glad that you are worshiping online with us. A couple things that I want to talk about. You saw in some of the announcement loops of things that are going on here at the church. We have a, a situation that is going to happen next week. Uh, we're going to start coming back a little bit in what we call phase one of a multiple phase, we don't even know how many phases it would be, of getting back into the church. Those who would like to participate in a live worship service are being asked to go to our website and sign on where it says save a seat. We have limited amount of seats due to social distancing and, and rules and regulations that are being offered to us from our go local government, our local officials, from those in the medical field have been talking to us saying, this is kind of what we would recommend. So we have limited amount of spaces in which we're going to have our live worship service at 9.30 in the morning. If you feel like uh, attending that service, please go on, reserve your seat. Once those seats are gone, we can't guarantee that you'll be able to get in. but you have that opportunity of reserving your seat, getting a confirmation, bringing the confirmation with you to church so that we can be as, as hospitable as possible in the church for you. If you are still enjoying worshiping online, we're going to encourage you to do that as well. Just worship online right where you are and, and the way we've been doing this over the course of the last few months. We love coming into your homes and being a part of who you are on your Sunday morning or whether it be Monday afternoon or whenever you're watching this. Know again, God is there. Also, and, and what we're recommending though is if you do sign up and you are feeling ill or not feeling well, and take that responsibility of saying, you know what, I'm, I am going to watch online today. We are happy to worship with you wherever, but that starts June 7th on the Save a Seat. So we're just asking you to be a part of that as well, okay? So now we're getting ready to go into our first song. We ask you to please stand wherever you are. If you know the song, sing it out loud. We're just happy to be with you, worshiping God with you wherever you are today. Let's sing. Redeem 
Again, it's just awesome to be with you. We're in downtown Washington, down at one of my favorite places to be. Since we've moved to Washington a couple years ago, I have spent many, many days down here at the riverfront, just enjoying nature, just enjoying what God has to give to us. And in this sermon series, again, the church has left the building. We are out here with you today, worshiping and praising God. At this time, we get to, uh, an opportunity to to give back to God what is His, to be generous in our giving, to uh, have the opportunity of, of saying, God, this is, is yours and, and you've given us to be a steward of this and to continue to be a giving people, a generous people, we are giving this back in response to our worship service to you today. There's a couple different ways you can do this. You can give online by going to our website, firstwashingtonumc.org, hitting the donate tab, and just following the instructions there. Or you can have the opportunity of text to give. You can text right where you are from your phone with this number that is on your screen right now. We would love for you to give. And today, we just ask that you celebrate that you are outside the building and that you are worshiping God wherever you are with your tithes and your offerings. And as we do so, we sing this next song together in worshiping God. Who am I that the Lord of all the earth will care to know my name, will care to feel my hurt? Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever-wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the Oh, 
Who am I? Let the eyes that see my sin will look on me with love and watch me rise again. Who am I? Let the voice that come the sea will call out through the rain and come the storm in me. Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the Gracious God, we thank you so much for everything that you have given us this day. Today, as we're, as we're pre-taping this message, we know that you are here. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for the sunshine that we are experiencing on this Sunday morning or wherever we're watching today. Or we, we thank you for the people that we're watching this with. Maybe we're sitting there alone saying, wait a minute, I'm not watching it with anybody. But we are. We're worshiping you with hundreds if not thousands of people around the world today. God, I just ask that you put a, put a special blessing upon anyone who is watching this service today. No matter what struggles or trials or tribulations that people are going through, God, I just ask that you come and invade us with the Holy Spirit. We also give you thanks for, for the joys that are going on in our lives, for, for the accomplishments that are happening all around us. God, we just ask that and give you thanks for and praise for all that you have given to us and we ask a special blessing upon each and every person that is experiencing joy this week. Lord, today we're going to be talking about a, a tough thing and that is called control, giving up control. When many of us, that's, that's what we strive for, that's what we want more than anything in the world is, is control. And today we're going to learn about what happens whenever we give you control and what happens when we're in control. And God, I just ask that the words that are coming from my mouth be your words and that they will fill our hearts and that they will instill in us a new spirit to go out and, and, and live in a new direction. Lord, today we lift up a prayer that Jesus taught us to pray and as a community of believers, of, of community of seekers, of, uh, as a community of people who are just watching this maybe for the first time and don't really know much about you. God, we lift up this prayer to you today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right. So now we come back into this, like I said, this sermon series of the church has left the building. And this whole, whole thing started with the thought process of what we're doing right now is being online. And not really realizing that at the time, a couple months ago, middle of March, that it was going to be different. Things, things were going to be different in our world. 
Things were going to be different in our community. Things were going to be different in our lives. Things were going to be different in our organizations, our businesses, our churches. And how we were going to present the message and the good news to God was going to be totally, totally changed. And with that in mind, as we continued on through the month of March and, and into the month of April, and, and we continued to hear uh, social distancing guidelines, and we, we talked about the, the coronavirus and stuff, something hit me. We're talking about the church has left the building, and we had been talking about that prior to, that the church is not just about the building. The building is a great place to come, to fellowship, to, to worship God, to, to gain knowledge. Uh, the building is something that is so um, a part of history, of, of church history. It's where Jesus went to the temple each and every day to, to celebrate God, to worship Him. And that's what we have been called to do as well. The things and times and have changed and are different. And so today, as we get ready to go into our second week of the church has left the building, last week we focused entirely on what God has in store. This is a, this is a sermon series based on what would God see as the church has left the building. Okay, And today, last week we focused on missions and being in mission with God. Today, the church has left the building and here we are in, in this beautiful place of Washington, Missouri, and you are in the place in which you are watching today. And we're going to break down uh, a few passages of Scripture today. So I encourage you to grab, again, grab your Bible, grab something to write on, uh, a highlighter, something to mark with in your Bible, to, or something just to write down these verses of Scripture so that you can go back and read them for yourself and see if you identify with what we're talking about today or maybe you see something different. Maybe the Holy Spirit is putting something else different on your mind and that's okay. So what I would love for us to do is just get grounded in Scripture right now based on these four questions. These are four questions that I talked with our, some of our teaching pastors that were on yesterday as we talked about the sermon, what the, what the message was going to be about today. And we went in with these four questions. When is a time in Scripture, and maybe it's a time in your life, in which God was in control? That was the first question. Second question is, when did people think that they were in control? The third question, what did God do to get the people's attention in Scripture? And four, what was the response of the people to God's coaxing, and God's judgment, God's uh, encour encouraging them to come back to where they wanted to be? where he wanted them to be. And so today we dive into a couple different passages of Scripture. And again, these, these are passages of Scripture. When I asked that question to uh, the teaching pastors, they came back with three of theirs, and I have one of mine. And I'm not going to tell you which is which, but because I want you to go out and find passages of Scripture in which those four questions can be answered. But first, the first one is found right in Genesis. And the first book of the Bible in Genesis, in Genesis 3. It's at a time in which God had created everything. God was in control. God knew exactly how he formed the world, of what, what all he put in, and he made human beings, you and I. He made Adam and Eve. And in his first part of making Adam and Eve, it says that God walked with them in the garden. Imagine that, God walking hand in hand with you wherever you were, and you being able to identify who God was. And he gave them strict instructions. God was in control. He says, you have everything here. You are the, uh, the trustees over everything that is in this garden, except for the tree that is in the center of the garden of knowledge. Now, imagine that if, if God came to you today and said, you have it all except for this. How many of us in our own humanness would say, hmm, man, I tell you what, I really want to know what's behind that door. I want to know what, what's going on over there. And this is what happened with Eve. It says here in Scripture that the serpent came to Eve. And we're going to be in Genesis 3. It said the serpent was clever. More clever than any wild animal God had made. He spoke to the woman. Do I, do I understand that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? See how the devil can twist things? See how people in our world can twist our words that we say? See how people can twist Scripture? 
to benefit them. And, and this is what the serpent is saying to, to Eve right now. He's saying, any tree? And she, she comes back with, the woman said to the serpent, not at all. We can eat from the trees in the garden. It's only about the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, don't eat from it. Don't even touch it or you'll die. The serpent told the woman, you won't die. God knows that the moment you eat from that tree, you'll see what's really going on. You'll be just like God, knowing everything, ranging all the way from good to evil. When the woman saw that the tree looked like good eating and realized what she would get out of it, she'd know everything. She took and ate the fruit and then gave some to her husband, and he ate. Immediately the two of them did see what's really going on, saw themselves naked. They sewed fig leaves together as makeshift clothes for themselves. Now, if we get into this passage of Scripture, and we see that God was in control and how people wanted to be in control. Notice what the one thing that they wanted more than anything was to be like God. And what Eve heard out of this whole thing from the serpent is, well, he's holding something back from you. Do we believe that in our everyday lives today? Is God in control of our lives or is he holding something back from us? Does God really know what he's doing? Maybe that's the question we ask in our own minds. Does God really know what he's doing? Maybe that was the question that Eve was asking. Then exactly why would he tell us to have everything except for that? I mean, we are a rebellious people. It started from Eve. It started from Adam and Eve. And then Eve goes to Adam and says, hey, check this out. We can go ahead and eat from this fruit and, and we're gonna have all kinds of knowledge. We're going to be like God. The, the residual and the repercussions that come from not being obedient to God are very, very harmful. They were in this case. What happens next is that God comes in and he finds out that they are hiding from him. Why would they be hiding, God may ask. Well, they know that they are naked. And he says, how do you know you're naked? Well, he knew that they had eaten from the, from the tree of knowledge. How many of us as young children, maybe even in our jobs today, our bosses will come to us and say, how do you know? Because they were the only ones that knew. How many of us have ever been told, I'm going to tell you this, but don't tell anyone else. You know, it's, this is a secret between you and I. And, and, and we, we find out. Now, now we're wanting to know even more. How many of us as little kids were told not to do something? And that was the one thing that we went and did. I know I, was, I did that several different times. If my mom or dad told me not to go do something, that was the one thing that I became curious George about. I could care less about the other things that they told me that I could do. It was the one thing that they told me I couldn't do. And God knew that they had eaten from the tree of, fruit, uh, from the tree of knowledge. And what happens next? He looks at, he, he doesn't hold back. God doesn't hold back his wrath. He, he, he says to the woman, and he says to the man, uh, you're going to have to work hard for a living. And for many of us in the world today, we're going, thanks, Adam, thanks for nothing. You know, you're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to work the ground. You're going to have to put in your hours and your work and your labor, and your back's going to be stiff and hardened, and your bones are going to be breaking down. And this happened because you were not obedient to me. He looks at the woman, and he says, matter of fact, you're going to have childbirth pains. You're going to have childbirth pains like you wish you would have never had whenever you're having kids. It wasn't set up that way. But now that you've done this, this is what's going to happen. Because you've taken over control and not allowed me to have control, this is what's going down. A lot of ladies today who have had children go, those childbirth pains, they don't just last just for the few moments that are there in, that we're going through the childbirth and the delivery happen. Those childbirth pains may go on forever you know, of, of, of raising a kid and, and taking care because they don't come with instructions. And those childbirth things are forever. But he doesn't hold back even on his creation of animals. He looks at the serpent and he goes, for what you did, you're going to be despised. Matter of fact, they're going to, they're going to kick your head and you're going to strike their heel. I don't know about you, but my least favorite animal in the entire kingdom of animals is a snake. You put a snake in front of me, I'm out. And I, don't, I think it may come right back to this passage of Scripture of they're going to be striking my hill and I'm going to be whacking their head. So when we lose control, when we lose focus, when we lose patience, 
with who God is. When we want to be like God, it's okay to be like God. It's not okay to be God. So the second passage of Scripture that we're going to look at today is in, is in Exodus. It's when Moses, a lot of people think that this is when Moses went up and got the Ten Commandments and came back down from Mount Sinai and, they, and the people had rebelled because of their impatience. Uh, that wasn't it. Uh, in uh, Exodus chapter 20 is when the, uh, the Ten Commandments were given. This is just a God calling Moses back up to give him even more rules and regulations for people to live, live by, to, to live a rewarding life. Moses is called up on Mount Sinai and he goes up into this cloud of smoke in Exodus 32. And he's been there for 40 days and 40 nights. When we are told as people, be patient, wait it out, that... Uh, People uh, that are going to be deciding things, are going to make, make decisions. They're going to be making hard decisions and tough decisions. What Moses was going up to hear from God, God was writing down on tablets for him to take back to the people. And these, these were known as, as words of testimony. These were going to be words that people could live by. Instead, what happens is, in Exodus 32, said when the people realized that Moses was taking forever and coming down off the mountain, see how impatient people can be, said they rallied around Aaron and said, Aaron was Moses' brother, do something, make gods for us who will lead us. That Moses, the man who got us out of Egypt, who knows what's happened to him. <laughs> so God was in control of Moses, he was also in control of the Israelites, the chosen people getting out of slavery, out of Egypt, he got them over to the promised land. And notice the rebellion that takes place with people. And it's taking place still today. If, if we become impatient with who God is and, and the timing that God has, we're going to try to figure out something to speed up the process. And these folks are, are saying, we need other gods. Aaron, who is Moses' brother, you think he would know better. Aaron, he, he uh, loses out. Uh, peer pressure gets to him. How many of us have ever had peer pressure get to us? Other people who think that they know more than what you do are saying, you do need to do it this way. This is what was going on. You need to pre present for us something else because obviously the guy who led us out of Egypt, this Moses character, he's not coming back. Aaron says, taking in the situation before, before built an altar before the calf. He made a golden calf. And the people started worshiping and praising the golden calf. They had something. They had something tangible that they could hold on to, that they could look at, that they could praise. And God tells Moses, um, hey, you might want to get down there and take care of those people. They're out of control. <laughs> I've always wondered how Moses felt about all of this because Moses didn't sign up for any of this. He, 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 came, he, he saw a burning bush. This, this is how Moses' whole ministry started. He saw a burning bush, was curious, why isn't that bush burning up? Wouldn't we be curious about why isn't that bush burning up? And in the meantime, God talked to him and then asked him to do this and asked him to do that. And Moses kept telling him, I'm not your guy. I'm not qualified. I can't speak very well. And Moses still, through God, by following God, by being obedient to God's commands, by allowing God to be in control, has now led him to hear. And some of us may look at this and go, well, why would we want to follow God? And God says, Moses, go down there and take care of this. And Moses goes down and he says, what are you doing, Aaron? Why did you go under the peer pressure? Why are... And then starts reprimanding all these people and turns Aaron loose and, the, and says, start killing people. If they're in this sinful nature, they can kill people. It ends with, God said to Moses, I'll only erase from my book those who sin against me. For right now, you go and lead the people to where I told you. Again, God is in control. Look, my angel is going ahead of you. On the day, though, when I settle accounts, their sins will certainly be a part of the settlement. Do we want to be in the sinful bunch? Of I mean, God is calling this out. He's saying, if they continue to sin, if they continue to disobey me, if they continue to not allow me to be in control, there's going to be a judgment day. God sent a plague on the people because of the calf they and Aaron had made. See, God sent a plague. Hmm, I wonder if that 
is kind of today. Maybe God's not happy. So then we go over to a prophet. A prophet by the name of Ezekiel. And so today what we're hearing is that when we want to take control, the first two stories, we want to take control, God will punish us. He will punish us because we want to be more knowing than God, and we will not rely upon Him, and we get impatient. Those are the two things to take away from those first two stories. If we, if we want to be in control and not allow God control, this is what will happen. The third story comes from Ezekiel. Ezekiel's chapters 1 through 3. You're writing this down. Ezekiel is a prophet. And if you read Ezekiel 1, you may think that this guy has... Um, he, he's maybe on a, uh, a drug trip. An acid trip, for lack of a better thing. He sees visions. He sees things that people can't see. He's talking about this. And he's writing it down. That when the wills go up uh, and, and they all go up together, when they come down, they all come down together. And what he's really saying is... When we allow God to be in control, we are one with God. When God moves, we move. When God stays, we stay. When God is out in the world, the church has left the building. And God is okay. He says, you know what, I want you to be out in the community. And Ezekiel has this to say because this is, it comes down to the individual. This is, whoever is watching today, me as well, it's our individual relationship with God. We cannot blame other people for our relationship with God. We may like to try, but when it really comes down to it, we are given commands that this is our relationship with God. And in Ezekiel chapter 2, it, it stands up, he, he stands up for humanity. God is saying, this is what I want you to do. This Ezekiel is what I want you to do. Now, if you want to know the backstory of Ezekiel, he is a very prominent priest who is a prophet, who is a visionary for the church, God's church. And God says to him, Son of man, stand up. I have something to say to you. And the moment I heard the voice, the Spirit entered me and put me on my feet. And as he spoke to me, I listened. He said, Son of man, I'm sending you to the family of Israel. A rebellious nation, if there ever was one. They and their ancestors have fomented a rebellion right up to the present. They're a hard case. These people to whom I'm sending you, hardened in their sin. Tell them, this is the message of God, the Master. They are a defiant bunch. Whether or not they listen, at least they'll know that a prophet's been here. But don't be afraid of them, son of man. And don't be afraid of anything they say. Don't be afraid when living among them is like stepping on thorns or finding scorpions in your bed. Don't be afraid of their mean words or their hard looks. They're a bunch of rebels. Your job is to speak to them. Whether they listen is not your concern. They're hardened rebels. Only take care, son of man, that you don't rebel like these rebels. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. When I looked, he had his hand stretched out to me and in the hand a book, a scroll. He unrolled the scroll and on both sides, front and back, were written lamentations and mourning and doom. See, the prophet Ezekiel, this priest, he, he may be struggling with what's going on with the fall of Jerusalem. Babylon had come in and taken over and, and worn out Jerusalem, had taken a lot of their people and exiled them to Babylon, had taken them away. And people from Jerusalem thought they had it all together. Everything was going great for them. I almost compare this part of Jerusalem to the United States of America today, of we have it all going on, everything's going well, but we, we've lost who we are and what is around us. We've lost it. We've lost God somewhere along the way. And what's being said here to Ezekiel, to, to go out and minister to the people, there's a directive here from God. He's saying this is on the individual person. All you can do is lead them. It's on that person to respond. But he gives a warning to, to Ezekiel. Don't get caught up in their rebellious ways or you could rebel as well. And I find that many people, leaders, priests, pastors, people who are speaking the Word of God, those that are teaching the Word of God, are feeling that these days, are, are hearing that because 
it's a rebellious world. And so God is speaking to us today. Allow me to be in control. Because when I'm not, things don't happen as well as they possibly could. When he's opening up the scroll, when he's handing him the scroll, a lot of Jewish folks will believe that the rabbis used to have the, uh, the young rabbi students take the Torah, they would cover it in honey, and then they would ask the students to lick off the honey because they wanted nothing else sweeter in their bodies than the words of God. That's, and, and so whether that's true or not true, that would be a great way of, of digesting what's in Scripture to put God in control of our world today. And last but not least, when God was in control and when people thought that they were in control. When God was in control, Jesus was alive. Jesus came to us and he ministered for three years as an adult in, in ways and teachings of, of the world and, and how we were to act and giving us the, the moral code of conduct and how we were to, to treat people, how we were to love God and to love our neighbors. And for that, he was killed. See, while God was in control, and if, if you want to go back to those passages of scriptures, you can go into the the, the passion of, of Christ, which we hear at Easter time. So who would have thought that you're going to hear an Easter sermon at the end of May, May 31st? Who, who, who would have thought that they're going to hear this Easter sermon again? But you are. Because, see, if you read chapters uh, in John chapters 19 and 20, you're going to hear about the crucifixion. You're going to hear about a world who turned on Jesus. You're going to hear about those that thought that they knew better, the religious leaders and, and the scribes that had been studying God. And this was God in person, and they missed it. And, and Jesus went to the cross for you for your salvation, for my salvation. He did this because he loved us. When we put God in control, the love that he exudes out to us may not be recognized at first, but it's seen as a glory in the end. See, because Jesus didn't stay nailed to the cross. And when they lowered him off of the cross, they didn't leave him, they put him in a tomb. And see, the people thought it was over, it was finished. If you're reading John chapter 19 and 20 though, chapter 20 specifically, we hear about the resurrection. <laughs> Friends, we are a resurrected people. We, we are a rebellious bunch, yes. But when we turn our, our eyes to God and put God in control, we are saved. Now let's just get back to that word control just for a few seconds. Because that's a tough word. That's a tough word in the, in the human language, no matter what language you may speak. Control means I got it, I want it, I need it. If I'm in control of something, then I have an opportunity of seeing what the outcome is. And when we give over control to anything, anyone, or anybody, sometimes we're saying, to ourselves, we're admitting defeat. Giving control back to God is not admitting defeat whatsoever. Actually, it's admitting that we're smart, <laughs> that, that, we're, that we know that God has our best intentions, our best desires, and all four of those stories, God had our best desires in mind. With Adam and Eve, he created it because he wanted that relationship. He wanted them to, to have children, and those children to have children, so that he would have more of a relationship with other people. But they decided that they wanted to do things their way. Because they were coaxed, and because they had peer pressure. Moses, what was Moses doing? Moses was hearing from God firsthand. He was on Mount Sinai getting the directions of what was to happen to the people that were below. God was taking time with Moses so that Moses could take time with those people and eventually take time with us. But th that bunch of people became very impatient. How many of us in today's world are very impatient with what's going on in the world? 
Friends, if you're the impatient person, pray for patience. Now, that's deadly. That's a deadly thing because God is going to continue to give you things to be patient for. In the third, uh, in the third book that we heard about, Ezekiel, the prophet, we understand that giving control to God is individual. It's on us. We can't blame anybody else. This is on us. And he knows that we are a rebellious people. And he says, I know your rebellion. And I can take care of the rebellion. And in the fourth, fourth book of John that we heard about Jesus. Jesus was in control. God was in control. The people decided that they didn't like that control. And they wanted to get rid of it. But what happened is, is God in the end won. And for that, we win. We are a, an Easter people. We are a risen people. And when we turn to God and give Him control, when we go outside the church building, wherever we are in this world, people will recognize it. People will want to hear from us. What is it that you have in you that I'm missing? And when we tell them we allow God to be in control of our lives, no matter what the cost, no matter what what's going to happen to us, things became simpler for me. So today I encourage you, wherever you are, if, if you're one that doesn't like control at all and, and you're okay and comfortable with giving somebody else control, then give it to God. Let God have control. If you are a control freak, if you have to have it, if you crave it, I'm encouraging you today to, to give that up. To say to God, I will give you control because I've, I've heard four stories in Scripture today of what happened whenever I took control. And if you're somewhere in between, I'm praying that you will lean towards giving God control. It is the way to salvation. So let's pray. Gracious God, I thank you so much for this day, and I thank you for being on here with my friends and family and even people I don't know that could be friends and family. God, I just ask that you be with us and you take over control of this world. Yes, God, we are a rebellious people. We are a people that need to be forgiven for whatever sins we have committed towards you or towards others. And God, I just ask that today we turn our hearts and our minds and our souls to you, allowing you total control of our heart, total control of our mind, total control of our spirit. That when we go out into this world today, that we don't have the weight of the world upon us because we are trying to control situations. But we allow you to take control, lifting the weight off of our shoulders, taking away those pains, those heartaches, the pressures of life. God, today I thank you so much for your son Jesus, who we heard in this story today, went to the cross, died, was buried, and rose again so that we may have salvation. Lord, I just thank you for everyone that's watching today, and may our ears that have heard these words today not only just hear them, but go live them. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. At this time, I'm just going to ask you, to, wherever you are, to stand and give worship to God. And again, if, if, if control is an issue in, in your life, if it's a control issue in my life, I'm just asking God to take that away. I'm asking God to turn, up, turn around and be in control and say, I've got this. I've got you covered. I'll take care of you. So please stand. And let's sing.
I lay it all down for the sake of you, my King, giving you my dreams. I'm laying down my rights, I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new life. And I I'm singing you this song, I'm waiting at the cross, and all the world holds dear, I count it all as loss, for the sake of knowing you, the glory of your name, to know the lasting joy, even sharing in your pain. And I surrender all to you, all to you. And I surrender all to you. My prayer for you today and my prayer for me is that we've been blessed. I, I, I don't know about you, but in the few moments that uh, I've had an opportunity to spend with you, to break down some scripture with you today, I'm encouraging you to go back and read those passages of scripture uh, today. Uh, again, uh, it was Genesis 3 uh, is where you're going to start out at. Exodus 32 is another one that you're going to be in. Ezekiel 1, 2, and 3, those chapters that you can be in as well. And then in John 19 and 20. If you want to go back and reflect on those today, that would be awesome. Now, bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. Gracious God, we thank you so much for this day that you have given us breath, given us life. And Lord, we just ask that as, as we continue to talk about how the church has left the building, we realize that you have never left us. You never will. And as long as we continue to turn to you and you keep calling us back, will continue to turn our eyes to you, turn our focus to you, and give you control. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, amen. You have a wonderful week. I can't wait until we see each other again. If you would like to come to the worship service next week in person, please don't forget to sign up, save your seat for that worship service. If not, if you're going to be online with us sometime next week, just say hello.
right down there in the comment section say hi. We can't wait to see you again next week. Have a wonderful and blessed week. Take care.